So the subject today is uh, Lucky You uh, Dealing with Legacy Inventory Development. You know, any single project can take way longer to assemble financing for and build than a lot of political administration's lifespans. But additionally, the, the any city's history, social and economic and political or policy history, is embodied in the buildings and the infrastructure and the public space. So we have two wonderful presenters today. Uh, we have asked Maria Teresa Denise Dos Santos yes. to <laughs> act as a main presenter. And she has a really fascinating experience in Sao Paulo, working uh, with the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development there, which they call Se 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 um, And then Mark Maloney, who I'm sure most local folks um, are quite aware of, <laughs> Uh, is a former uh, director of the Boston Korea Development Authority. Uh, so, saying that, welcome to everyone in Korea Trace, would you like to say? Yeah. Well, first of all, good morning. That, uh, well, it's um, almost good afternoon. Talk about this. So this is one of the programs that uh, I think you were most interested in in this, in this um, talk. It's what we call the three R's program. So it's a regularization, recovery of credit, and rehabilitation of the buildings, of the old housing projects that we have in Sao Paulo. Not the ones that we're building right now, but the ones that we, we had uh, before, the legacy, okay? Forgot. So the regularization is to regularize the occupation of each housing unit, because sometimes you will find the family there that is not the original family that you put there. The person that lives in this unit is not the person that we have in our system, uh, according to our system that lives in this. So they don't have the titles, they don't have the permission to be in that unit. So we have to regularize that occupation. A decree in Sao Paulo that says if they've occupied since uh, two years ago, if they were there in this housing unit and they can prove it, then we can regularize it. Aye. Because these, these units, they were abandoned from the government for so long, and people lost credibility in that, that they would someday have the, the original titles and they sold it or from, for other reasons. Aye. So the family that lives there is also a family, low-income family, and they paid to be in this unit. So it's not, it wouldn't be fair for the government to just throw them out. <laughs> because they also need housing. So we, we regularize. There's a limit so that they don't continue to do it. But uh, we, we, we have the an entity. And the important thing is that since 1987 to now, the area that they occupy in the city is practically the same. It was 22.8 kilo, square kilometers, now it's 23 square kilometers. So it means that they're growing population Veg organic. organic growth, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're growing, they're verticalizing, and they're not growing, they're not spreading in the city. Okay. So the guidelines of the program, this is a change of mentality in Brazil, because, uh, and now we're removing the least we can. So the fair does it mean? It means that we are recognizing the investment that each of these families made in their houses. Um, so we, we build new housing units and we try to build these units on the same site when we can. So we I would argue with those people that, in fact, the issues in Boston are just as dramatic and just as real. Um, we just don't see them quite the same way, maybe because we're living on the other side of the fence in the condo development for $250,000 or a million dollars. But we are in the same world, and we are actually experiencing very similar things. And so I'm very happy that Deirdre and her folks were able to bring you here and to share your experience. And I, I had a disc here that I was going to show you, the redevelopment of Orchard Gardens. Uh, started out as a horrific public housing project, looking worse than some of the projects that you were showing us on the screen. Not very long ago, in Mosick's neighborhood, an access back to regularize a public housing project that had been taken over uh, by very bad people 
um, who were, were making everyone very fearful um, and therefore were not able to organize, were not able to kind of get them out there. They were all there, we knew they were there, but they were hard to government. Um, in Boston over the years, our legacy issues have been um, excessive government involvement in uh, uh, redevelopment neighborhoods um, and displacing people uh, unfairly. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to get over this enormous credibility obstacle. Um, that kind of brought me to the thought of, you know, you're doing all this housing, you're, 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 you're taking people, you're taking them out and putting them in here. Um, how, how do you keep funding this and how do you implement the upkeep, the, the continuation of this from going back into the deterioration of, of the housing units you had? How do, how do you police that? How do you, is it? I don't know okay. how to answer that because that's our biggest challenge right now. Yeah. Uh, we're, still, we're still studying this because sometimes it will work and it will be perfect and, and some other times it will destroy it in three months. And we get very sad when it happens. I was thinking about, this is carrying on very much from your question, what happens in 20 years? Because you have all these people, let's say it works, right? Everyone pays their, it's not rent, but their monthly payment. And then they own it in 20 years. Mm -hmm. What I've seen from some of the work I've done through AHI in Ireland is they had these great social estates, which were similar in that people paid a very small amount of rent in over 10, 20, 30 years. They then owned the property. They were row houses, they weren't tall like this, but that's sort of the equivalent over there. Then what happened is everyone owned them, they'd amassed a bunch of wealth, they left, and they became absentee landlords. And now those are awful slums. And they're trying to find ways to reintegrate, you know, reinvigorate them as neighborhoods and mix up the, the income levels and mix up the communities again and really try and get them functioning. So there's sort of a there's the what happens in three months if we don't take care of it, but also what happens in twenty years? If we're going to do this great wealth transfer <clears throat> by giving people the subsidized uh, how I guess the parallel I want to draw in both cases is once things get bad enough, the disparity between the two worlds gets bad enough, mm -hmm. we figure out how to fund a way of changing things. And I would argue that the greatest wealth transfer in this country in the last 20 or 30 years has been in the wrong direction. I'm not objecting to that subsidy. My objection is to the sort of the way that it's more than semantics. The class is, you know, one is an entitlement, one is a subsidy. I'm not getting a handout, but the person who's getting a rent subsidy is getting it. So we have structured it so that I'm okay, but they're not, and I've got to take care of them.